Hello, ladies and gentlemen. It's Christmas week everywhere around the planet, but it's still a work week. And I think a lot of things are still getting done. Happens to be one of those side effects of Christmas being on a on a weekend. And by the way, New Year's is on a weekend too. So I hope you guys got your, your seatbelts buckled in because I think that, you know, between now and then the year, a lot of stuff's going to get done more than probably any past year you can remember. Maybe it's a combination of this calendar. Maybe it's a combination of all this stuff getting pushed back, right? Since pandemic times, but it, it'll be interesting. I can't, I can't tell you my schedule has been absolutely smashed. So, which is great, better than the alternative because I can only watch so much Netflix and I don't know, Home Alone reruns, uh, you know, until I'm you know falling asleep in the chair. So welcome to MSP Initiative. This is December 20th, 2022. Uh, welcome to the very tail end of the year. Uh, MSPinitiative.com, this session and every other session we've ever done is going to be there under sessions, both in podcast, audio and video format. And then, you know, we'll, we'll talk about what 2023 looks like, because like I've, I've seen a master schedule that my teams helped me create. And man, if you thought 2022 was busy. I think 2023 is going to be just crazy. And let's hope that the airline places don't go so expensive that you can't get anywhere. Today's special guest, and I really appreciate from him from coming on because apparently he's super busy too. Peter from Service Leadership, now a ConnectWise company. I don't know if you guys paid attention to that. It was a little while ago. Peter, how are you doing today? I'm doing great, George. How are you? Oh, you know, it's a little cold here in Philly. I was telling, I was down in Clearwater last week for the uh, Marketopia GrowCon event in, in Clearwater. And I was like, man, it's great weather for a Philly guy. I was actually surprised that like the weather was kind of nice up until about a couple of weeks ago and it was abnormally warm, but it's not that way anymore. It's super, <laughs> super cold. So um, yeah, fun times. Where are you based uh, on? So George, define cold. Because I'm in Wisconsin and it's uh, six degrees right now. Oh, you, so you, you blow me out of the water. So like we're in like that, like just under 30, 31. I think we're at 29 degrees today. So I think you got me beat by a wide margin. Yeah. Uh, yeah. It's not a record that I like holding. It's a, uh, I'd rather be on the other end of it. That Tampa yeah, weather never, sounds pretty good. Yeah. I've never made it to Green Bay for a game. I know that's shame on me as a sports uh, NFL guy. And um but I, I have been to Minnesota for the Super Bowl. And let me tell you, negative degrees is not the right weather for a Super Bowl. I think it's a warm weather event. Yeah, yeah. That it, Was that uh, three years ago or so, four 20, years ago? 2017 in Minnesota, yeah. Wow, that long ago, five years ago already. Yeah. Yeah, yeah it's, uh, um, I definitely understand the snowbird mentality. Let's put it that way. <laughs> 100%. Like 70 degrees in clear water? Yeah, sign me up. That was cool. And for a guy that travels a lot, warm weather is definitely my 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 favorite. Um, so, service leadership for the people that never got down into, you know, like your area, your bubble, right? I know you guys have been super popular in like peer group land and like being able to like kind of figure out where people fall and you know in in the you know I know I know Paul used to say best in class, right? Like, hey, where do the people who are doing really well sit? Where this like the average, and like if you're not making money, where do you fall into the you know to the to the you know category two? Big picture, right? What does service leadership do, and like how do you collect your information? And then we can go into like the fun stuff. Yeah, it's a great question. Service leadership is really known for our data. Uh, we started benchmarking the industry about 18 years ago. As you mentioned, Paul Dippel founded the company, and he and Brian O'Connell really built the concepts that we run with today. Um, so every quarter, uh, we run the largest benchmarking sample in the industry, and it's a worldwide sample. And every quarter, our clients put their data in at, at the end of the quarter, and we run, uh, as you referred to, the best-in-class calcs. And best-in-class, in our definition, is the top 25% of uh, profit profitability in any given quarter. So every quarter, we look at um, what's the 25% most profitable companies out there based on their adjusted EBITDA. And uh, then we pull out all sorts of other performance characteristics out of their financials. So, uh, but our, our uh, theory and our belief is that first and foremost, you have to look at profitability because somebody can move around expenses, they can move around revenue, they can do some different things within their financial statement to manipulate individual KPIs within their financials. But at the end of the day, all of it comes out in the wash and your profitability. So uh, our goal is to create the most profitable uh, companies out there. Uh, we'd love to see everybody running 
uh, highly profitable businesses. Unfortunately, today there's way too many MSPs that are not. Um, in our last quarterly numbers about uh, our bottom quartile, which is the opposite, the bottom 25%, uh, by definition, every one of them in there was not profitable. And it, the cutoff to get into that was negative 3.8% profitability, which means not only was the bottom quartile not profitable, but a big chunk of the median was also not profitable or was barely getting by. And these days, the last couple of years have been really good in the industry. There's no reason that somebody should be losing money today. Um, um, if you're losing money today, figure out today, stop whatever else you're doing and figure out what are we going to do to fix this? Because the industry overall has been doing really well the last couple of years. Mm. So let's let's like zoom in a little bit, because obviously people could be one man, you know, out of the basement guy all the way to venture backed, you know, kind of sure. platform company, I guess is what they like to call them. I call them face companies, but I digress. Um so in the bottom quartile, right? And and I don't know, like I've heard from many people, right? Every two to four years, the bottom 20% of all MSPs turn over, right? Like guys close up, new guys fall out of corporate IT maybe and start up. And like that never stops, right? That keeps on you going. Bet. So like, you know, what is the middle of the road, right? Like what is considered average profitability against what is it? Is it 120,000 MSPs? Is it 80,000? The number changes every time I talk to somebody. Yeah, if you can find an exact number, let me know. Um, uh, we've been looking at somewhere between 25,000 and 40,000 MSPs in North America, but okay. nobody really knows. I mean, it depends on your definition. Okay. Our industry is one that has a really low barrier to entry. So we're much like accounting or law where you see, you're seeing the big get bigger, but at the same time, you're seeing a lot of new guys start up. And you're correct. If you're in the bottom quartile and you're losing money, you really have three ways that your business is going to go. You're either going to be acquired. And if you're acquired, it's going to be at a pretty big haircut. You're you're going to be selling your business at a discount just based on uh, not being profitable. So that's certainly one scenario. Um, another scenario is uh, you're going to go out of business because at some point, everybody gets sick of writing checks into their business and makes the decision to uh, do something else. Um, or you're gonna find religion and figure out how to boost the operational maturity level of your company and do things in a better way and start making money, get into the median or get into the best in class. The best in class is the exact opposite. What we typically see in the best in class is about 80% of the companies are in there quarter in and quarter out, that there's about 20% dropout, um, but very, very little, relatively speaking. And it makes sense. I mean, if you you know how to run your business in a way that's delivering top quartile profitability, why would you change it, right? <laughs> you're, you're doing the right things. You're doing things in a way that's sustainable quarter in and quarter out. Um, so once you get your business to that point, uh, you're going to try to continue to improve it, obviously. But Largely, you're going to maintain those things that have that have gotten you those great results. So, um, so you're right. Bottom quartile, in and out all the time. Top quartile is pretty stable. Got it. So, like, because uh, you have a lot of visibility because you've been doing this for 18 years. I didn't realize it was that long. You know, everybody always says, right? Hey, you know, this acquisition thing is on fire. The industry's got to crunch itself in half in the next two, three, four years. And like, you know, basically it's either going to be poor or rich. And I'm like, even if a thousand transactions happen a year, and I don't know if that's even a real number, there's a lot more people out there than there are transactions happening. Do you believe that? Or, or is that, there's a truth to that? There's, there's truth to both sides. So we took a deep dive. One of the things that we do every year is we do an annual report and it's the service leadership annual industry profitability report. And it's really, a, it's a really fun, captivating read, George. It's about 250 pages of data. Wow. So chart after chart after chart, it's just, it's, uh, you can't put it down. It's, it's just really, really fun to read. Uh, no, in all seriousness, uh, we, we go into a lot of data in the industry, obviously, with with that much analysis. And one of the sections that we did this year was we did a deep dive on the the uh, rumor of the death of the small MSP. That with all of the consolidation over the past several years, we were hearing the same thing that 
uh, there's just no small MSPs left or hardly any of them left. And you got to be huge to be successful in the business. And my MSP is only doing two, three million. I better sell or I'm not going to be able to compete anymore and that kind of thing. So we decided to take a look at the data. And what we found, we went back and compared 2021 to, to 2014. What we found was that, yeah, there's been a lot of consolidation, but still about 70% of the industry is still under, under that $5 million mark um, that the industry still dominated. It's, that's, that's a smaller percentage than it was in 2014. Um, but, you know, 60, 70 percent of the industry being under that three to five million range, that's still where the industry is dominant. Right. So, yes, there's definitely consolidations. Yes, private equity has made a significant impact on the channel. Um, but uh, but the de the rumor of the death of the small MSP is greatly exaggerated. The industry is still doing really well. Um, and one of the in interesting things with the data we hear a lot that, well, I've got to be big to be best in class or to be to be top quartile profitability. Um, and it's just not true. If you look at our data sample, we have some large companies that are best in class profitability. We've got a bunch of them that are bottom quartile that are losing money today. Um, we've got a bunch of smaller uh, smaller shops that are best in class and doing great and run really, really effective operations. We also have a bunch of smaller shops that are losing money today. So um, so I hear it all. We go in, as you said, we do peer groups. And uh, when we go in and meet with the groups, we actually go room to room and we talk to the MSPs in every room. And I, uh, a true story, this spring, I, I went from one, well, every one of my stories will be true, George, but this one is, uh, is definitely... This spring, I went into one room and uh, was going over an industry update, talking about the latest quarter. And uh, one of the members in the room, this was a group that was made up of all larger MSPs. One of the members in the room said, Peter, data is interesting and everything, but everybody in this room, look around the room. Everybody in the room knows that the only way you can be top quartile profitability is if you're a smaller MSP, because you don't have the back office expenses, you're not paying sales reps, the owner is out there selling and they're doing some engineering and they're able to wear all these hats and that spreads cost out. So the only way you can be top quartile profitability is if you're a small to mid-sized MSP. Amazing. And I said, well, I'd never thought that anyone would say that, but I'm thinking. And I said, I said well, no. Um, and we talked about the differences and the quartiles and the and the sizes and and geographically we we don't see any uh um similarities geographically and and he argued a little bit and ultimately we said we'll agree to disagree and um uh, so i left the room uh 10 minutes later i'm in another room and it's made up of all msps that are sub three million dollars and one of the msp owners in there said after i went through my industry update so well, peter this is all really interesting, but we all know the only way you can be best in class is if you're large enough and you have economies of scale and you have a sales team that can grow faster and you've got a back office that can support your employees at scale. And there's no way for a small MSP to be best in class. We got to be one of these big PE back guys. And I said, you got to be kidding me. I just, <laughs> just left this other room, right? And so... Pretty like widespread like that we hear both sides. Um, that's interesting. So <clears throat> devil's in the details. What are the top few things that the people who are in that upper, you know, top quartile are doing consistently to, to make sure their revenue profitability, you know, is there? I, I think, you know, let me throw a couple of thoughts out there before you answer the question. Trends throughout this entire year has been, Hey, liability is becoming greater, right? So as the MSPs are now having to do more in order to take their risk profile down instead of waiting for something big to happen. So that's cut into their profitability. Two, um, personnel, and, and maybe the buyer-seller markets flipped at this current point in time, just because all these big companies have been cutting double-digit headcount, right? And there's a lot of people out in the street, but up until recently, you know, it's just been very aggressive in terms of being able to onboard new people. And of course, the cost of doing that uh, has been going up over time, uh, generally. And then lastly, you know, like, you know, 
I think net new business has always been difficult. If you talk to any MSP group, like sales and marketing seem to always be the top topics over decades now. But, you know, now on the other side of that is churn management, right? Trying to make sure that on the bottom end, you're not losing customers. You know, while you're, if you're spending too much time adding net new logos, you know, you want to make sure that you're not, you know, leaking oil out the back door too. So putting all of that together, the guys who are consistently just crushing it and their profitability is maintaining or growing, what's the secret sauce? Where are they, you know, doing well and what can we concentrate on? So what are the, what are the traits or characteristics that drive best in class profitability, mm -hmm. uh, recruiting and retention and, uh, and sales and go to market? How much time do we have? <laughs> uh, 45 more minutes Peter. <laughs> yeah um yeah it's a it's a great question and i would answer um we could literally spend hours on on answering that question and we do we provide a lot of content as you know in uh thought leadership um my shorter answer on it would be everybody in the industry has been dealing with wage inflation the last couple of years so there's tremendous inflationary pressures on everybody and uh, so really understanding your your labor market and, and recruiting and retention is really critical. But I'd take a step back from the traditional and just understanding what you're paying. And by the way, it's such a big subject that uh, we decided to bring back our, pro our compensation benchmarking report. And uh, we just closed the entry for the for data entry on that. And we had an all-time record number of companies submit their data. They'll all, they'll all get a free report in March when it, when we're done uh, issuing it. But in total, there were over 10,000 positions that we got data on. So wow. it's going to be a great report. It'll be out in March. And anybody who didn't get their data and can will be able to buy a copy for $1,800. Um, so no question, that's a huge issue. So number one is price increase methodology. The the best in class are charging a significant amount more than the bottom quartile and the median are for similar services. So um, they're better at increasing their pricing. They've got uh, they've got annual increases built into their multi-year agreements. Uh, they're not out having to negotiate those. But go even further back. Um, there's a number of different things that we teach that all add up to discipline, and the best in class have a narrower idea of who they're going after their target customer profile is is much less broad they have a, a really narrow um, uh, tech stack so they're implementing the same technology across all of their customer base and they're doing it consistently without deviation they're better at onboarding and so they're when they onboard they're putting that tech stack in much quicker they're documenting better they're getting their clients into alignment faster. So that does all of those things add up to a few things uh, for those providers. Number one, they're able to staff their operations with a greater percentage of level one techs than somebody who's out there supporting multiple technologies. Um, you know, if you're out there supporting uh, two, three, four different firewall brands, for example, on your amongst your customer base. Well, you need a much higher, uh, higher paid tech with a lot more experience because it's exponentially more complex to to support your firewalls, right? And that's just one example. What we see amongst the best in class is they're really disciplined. They've got they know who they want, they know who they're a good fit for. All of their marketing is built around that. All their sales is built around finding that customer. As a result, when they find that customer, they're able to tell that customer, look, you are who we are built to service. Here's why. Um, a lot of them are vertically focused now, so they might have 30, 40, 50, 60% of their revenue coming in from a single vertical. All of those things make them really appealing to a strategic buyer who is willing to pay more for IT. The bottom quartile, when we see the data, the top quartile are running about 51% service gross margin on their managed service offerings. The bottom quartile folks are around, around uh, 35, 36%. And so um, the bottom quartile is selling just as, as many new logos as the median and the top quartile. Mm. But the um, but the top quartile is getting a lot more for what they're selling and they're, they're much better at margin. So, 
Um, they're just more attractive to a strategic buyer. So there's a whole bunch of things that go into that, but all of them ultimately tie back to uh, the quality equation of what you're going to deliver to your clients, which is going to help retention. It's going to help referrals. So you're going to get uh, more referral based growth. Um, so it ties hugely into your sales and marketing. Um, and it's also going to tie in a lot to your profitability and your employees are probably going to be getting yelled at a lot less throughout the course of the day. So it tends to make it a little easier to get them to hang around. Um, and so it ties, it does tie into recruiting and retention as well. And again, you can staff your operation much more efficiently if you're, if you're running a much more disciplined operation. So best in class, what we see, they know who they're fit for. They're really disciplined on who, on, bring that customer in and uh, walking away from all the other ones. They also do paid assessments. I mean, there's a whole bunch of other stuff I could add to the discussion, but in short, I would say it's really, they know who they are and they're really disciplined about it. Interesting. Um, so Peter, yeah, we, can I ask a question? Go so, for it. Yeah, yeah. I, I guess I'm kind of curious. You know, you say that the people who have really narrowed their focus, give me some, some advice to, to the listeners out there that, how do you handle the situation when something that is a bit outside of that um, select group that you've decided and you get some wonderful opportunity and you sit back and you go, oh my gosh, look at this. Here, here is a wonderful opportunity. However, it is outside of, of that norm. Do you, do you really have the discipline to, to walk away and say, sorry, I, I realize this is a hundred thousand. This is a million dollars a month. Okay. But I got to walk away from it because it's outside of my norm. Or do you sit back and you say, this is so attractive looking here. Maybe I should deviate and I should start looking at some of these other things. G give me your, your advice on that. Yeah, the uh, shiny object, object syndrome is, is real and alive in our space. Um, and I lived it. I, I ran prior to joining service leadership a little over a year ago. I ran an MSP in Wisconsin, Minnesota, and Iowa that we grew from about 2 million a year up to about 17 million a year. And one of the lessons we had to learn early on was, uh, was exactly this lesson because, yeah, when you're trying to grow and somebody comes along that's 3X of your normal customer average size and they're outside of your TCP, but the number is pretty big, it's really enticing uh, to take them on. So I've been, been down the road. Um, a couple of questions that every every provider should ask. Number one is when you're coming up with a target customer profile, first start with size. So what's the size that you're going to target? And the reason the size is important is because within customer size ranges, uh, what you typically see is the ability to use a single tech stack. Tech stack tends to change as you go to different sizes of customers. The, uh, your managed service offering uh, is going to be able to be the same amongst that size range, typically. Um, but perhaps most important and most overlooked is that your processes will also be able to be the same. So let's say my tech stack is really common amongst, um, amongst SMB-focused MSPs. Let's say my tech stack is 25 to 100 employee shops. And I get somebody in the door, Brent, to your example, who my salesperson comes in the door and says, well, hey, uh, Peter, great, great news. I had a really successful day today. I've got an awesome prospect. They really need our services. And but they're not they're bigger than 100 employees. There are 130 employees. Um, well, the first thing I would ask is, are we going to be able to use all of our other processes? tech stack and our pricing and packaging for that 130 employee uh, engagement. It's entirely possible if it's a, if it's not that far outside of our TCP that we might, right? That maybe they also don't have any IT people in house. They're gonna be able to call in the same way, send tickets in the same way. We're gonna be able to do the same processes to do follow-up forms. But what starts, the minute you start to get into, yeah, we can bring this customer on, but they now have internal IT and we're here, our contact's going to be different. And they said they're all, they're all good, but they want to, every time they call in, be able to go straight to a level two or a level three and not talk to a level one 
So all we've got to do is change this one thing in our routing for tickets. Once you start doing that stuff, you just broke broke your factory. Um, and so the the first question is, if you want to stay within a TCP, is are you able to stick to those three components? Now, if the if the sales same salesperson comes in and says, "Hey, Peter, really exciting! I've got this 500 employee shop. Our TCP is 25 to 100, but got this 500 employee company, and they've heard all these great things about us, and our contact from this other customer is over in there. He's now their CFO and wants to do business with us, etc." That's when you got to be really careful. Um, and I, I've lived it. I brought on a, a 1100 employee customer once through an acquisition, and it almost killed our operation. It almost destroyed our, our help desk. And it wasn't when we were immature, but when that happened, we were doing 10 million of revenue. We had a really sophisticated help desk operation, really capable. Um, but all everything that we did for all of those other customers didn't work for this other customer. We had to adapt our operation. And by adapting our operation, it it really significantly affected the service quality of what we were providing to the rest of our customer base. So if you get that big customer opportunity in, and that's where you really decide you want to take your operation, then that's a different discussion. You want to, at that point, uh, rebuild your factory. So your, re your factory then is one designed to service that TCP and you want to phase out your other customer base and move into that new factory. But don't try to don't try to walk down the middle of the highway. It's a rarely a good strategy for survival. Excellent. Wow. That, is, that is very interesting. I so said <laughs> first of all, I think it's I, I think if you understand the business and you really have a good technical foundation and you understand business processes and business process engineering, you scale up and down the ladder. I mean, we have from 15 uh, people engineering firms to doing the Boeing shop floor or automating the West Coast ports. It's because we're solid in our fundamentals and those scale up and down very easily. And I think without affecting your organization, it's because you have the, the right people um, and you and you have a real business understanding versus vendor specific understanding. I think there's a difference in tech in technology. When you understand technology and you understand things down to the layer approach, you can scale up and down pretty easily. But, but, but Keith, I mean, there's just some truth to the fact that and if the organization's larger, they then try and dictate to you more than you, saying, hey, here's our process that we follow. I, I disagree. No? Okay. I completely disagree for a couple of reasons. Go ahead. First of all, because they're larger, they're usually very inefficient and effective. Boeing came to, and Boeing's a lot bigger than Distum. I'll just put that out front. Boeing came to us for our expertise in the gaps they couldn't fill. It was not Boeing telling us how to deliver services. It was Boeing asking us how to... Uh, reduce FOD and to make the shop floor more efficient for final assembly of the C-17. When the ports of LA and Long Beach and the West Coast ports came to us, that was after they dealt with IBM and parole systems and back in 1999. They came to us based on our expertise and knowledge and said, how can you make dispatch more efficient, more effective and secure? If, you, if you're solid in your base, and you know your your business, people come to you. I don't think size, well, that's horrible. I don't think size matters. I didn't mean it that way. But I don't think size really matters. I think it matters on your personal expertise level. And and um, just because a company's big doesn't mean they have all those bases covered. Yeah, Probably uh, means we've, we've, talk, we've talked a lot, Keith, about your business is not the prototypical, you know, MSP IT services company. So just, let's just be fair there. And then, you know, for the people who are, you know, whether they came out of internal IT and set up, you know, uh, an MSP or whether they, you know, just learned technology, right. And kind of just grew and built a company, you know, almost accidentally, I say sometimes, you know, it's just somebody who was really good at technology and then made it their, their revenue stream. There is some truth to what Peter's saying that, you know, hey, you know, it doesn't matter what vertical, right. 
you know, I'm, I'm really, I figured out how to really do 25 person organizations really well. The 125 person organization, their expectation level is different, right? They're maybe used to things differently. They're not calling into or using a ticketing system. They expect that there's an on-site person versus, you know, always going through, you know, this you know, kind of remote process. Like I've seen this myself, right? And maybe I'm not the perfect, uh, you know, you know, decider of all things, but there is something to be said for, you know, having things ready to go, right? You're the 911 center and you have the capacity to field all the calls versus having to muscle your way through adding resources when you're maybe punching above your weight. I, you, I mean, basically, you basically said what I was saying. If you're, okay. if, you're, if you're grown up and you learned in a niche, you learn you're doing a cookie cutter niche. You're selling ABC firewall that's only to small businesses. That is not what I was describing. I said, if you have a base, in technology, where it doesn't matter what firewall I have, I understand the, the layer, right? And you have an understanding of business process as you scale. If you design your business around a certain delivery model, then you don't scale. So I, we said the same thing. So if you were raised in doing, you know, I sell SonicWall to 20 person offices, and I said, I put ABC, you know, antivirus, and this is what I get. That's right. You've limited. That's what I'm saying. You've limited your ability to scale. Yeah, you, our our experience. This Bruce, uh, no disrespect to you, Keith, but it sounds like you have a different business than uh, my MSP and what we've been through. Our experience was when the whales, the few whales that we had, they pushed us around, and we recently we rolled up uh, with the twenty. So we're now actually with the twenty MSP, and it's a night and day type of environment because we've actually had a few of these discussions with our formal whales, quote unquote. And because of the processes that the 20 uses, we've gone back to these clients and say, sorry, we're not going to do these extreme accounting measures for you. We're not going to do these extreme help desk measures for you. And you know what the client says? Uh, okay, we, we don't have the, we can't push you around anymore. So we'll adopt your process. Right. That's a, You're making my point. They don't they are coming to you because they need a gap filled. And if they respect your ability to, to align technology with their business process and the workflows, they will follow your lead because your rich history tells them that you know what you're doing. Hmm. This is I don't go to my doctor and then tell them, here's the article I read on curing the cancer. I go to him because that's his expertise. Okay, Pete, you go for it, buddy. Yeah, I, I think I think oh. another way, the other Pete. <laughs> <laughs> I, I think another way of framing it would be that um, a lot of times MSPs perceive that they need to act a certain way and they put self pressures to hmm. negotiate price, negotiate terms, and they fold because they fear that they won't get the job if they stand their ground. And I, I think nine times out of 10, if you stand your ground, you know, people say to me, well, is there any room on the price? And I say, no. And they say, you came back with that really quick. I said, why would I give the thing that's most important to me away? Would you do it? And I put it back on their shoulders. I asked them, would you, would you give that price up? And they say, no. I said, then why would you ask me to do it? Right. So there's got to be a little bit of confidence and arrogance in the way that you sell, no matter whether you're a small MSP, medium or large. Right. And and small MSPs through maturity will gain that confidence. Right. But until they come out of the gate swinging like that, they don't do it. And George, you know me how I am on price pressure. I just say, no, why are we doing that? We wow. don't need to do it because they test you first. And if you do it once, they know you're going to do it again. So if you say no, they know when they come to you next time, don't ask. Well, yeah, I, do. I agree well, with Pete on that. Let me, pause, let me pause one second. So if you don't ask, you can't get. Let's be honest. That's number right. one. I always ask, even if the answer is no. Number two, there's this interesting dichotomy following what you just said, Pete. MSPs, for some reason, think, hey, the larger they get, the lower my price point should come because now they have more of something. Hmm. So like I should bring my price point down because it's like a bulk discount if that's the right way to say it. But in reality, the larger they are, the more expensive it is, right? 
And like, that's the inter that's where people become unprofitable. I think once they get past that next level that they haven't played in yet is because mm -hmm. they haven't figured out the right pricing band to hold their, you know, their, their, their kind of trail in, and then they end up falling into a negative and they're running around with their hair on fire. Hey, bald, that's what happens, right? Because they literally <laughs> never got it under control, right? That's what I've seen. And to your point, I think that's where people get into trouble when they're trying to go, you know, to the next band of things. Uh, I would agree. Things. And again, that's a perceived a perceived by the MSP, not perceived by the end user or buyer, right? Yeah. The buyers know what they're what they're going to buy, and they know that if they're going to move to another MSP, that you know, if you ask the one question, I always love the one question I ask. Uh, you know, rate your rate your current technology service on a scale of one to ten, and most times they come back at a five or six when they're fed up and ready to move. And I say, what are you willing to pay for it? And they say, hey, X. I said, okay, if I could get you to a nine, eight and a half to nine, would you be willing to pay? Why? And they'd say, well, I don't pay that now. And I say, well, why would you perceive that you're going to move up in a better quality of service and not have a price adjustment? Hey, George. Right? Hey, it's so, Matt. Uh, first time listener, long time talker. How are you doing today? How you doing, Matt? Doing well, buddy. I don't know about the first time, but yeah, got you. What's up, buddy? How you doing? Hey. I'm good, man. I'm running around a lot today, but I I, I just started listening to you guys a little while ago. and just wanted to add in that, um, you know, Valiant, the MSP that I've worked for for the past seven years, uh, in the early days when I worked there and even before when I was a customer, there were definitely issues in how they value themselves. And you could see that in the pricing, which is why I got lots of really great pricing in the beginning. But, you know, our, our president, George, has been working with service leadership probably like the past three or four years now. And what's being talked about is what happens to us. You know, our gross profit margins are doing well. I embrace the idea of the TCP model. And in New York City, you know, if there's a company that's looking for IT in there and media or PR, one of the verticals that we target, we're the kind of de facto standard in a lot of cases. That wasn't the case when I was a customer. Uh, that wasn't a case before, you know, George and the team started going to the SLI meetings every quarter or whatever it is, and then coming back and hammering me with ideas. And over the past two or three years, I finally embraced them. I'm looking at Pete so, so, so like affectionately like that. I don't even know the guy, but I'm looking at him and saying, I see the service leadership logo behind him. I'm just happy. It transformed the business completely into one that can grow and take certain risks, but also know exactly, you know, where we're comfortable when it comes to the types of companies that we work with, the kind that we service and uh, a level of quality, uh, not quality, sorry, confidence. Where you can say, look, we're not the cheapest in town. We're not the most expensive, but we know what we're worth. And if you go talk to any of the company that's worked with us in the past, which if you're in publishing or media or something like that, everyone's all over the place. Everyone knows someone. You're going to turn around and go, oh, yeah, they're good guys. And a lot of that came from working with service leadership over the years. The yeah, bigger I mean, the company, the bigger your client, that. the right. higher their burden rate is, and the more efficient and effective you can make their processes through discipline, workflow, lean, mm -hmm. and those kind of things. So their ability to pay you more is greater. And you your value to them you, is greater. You're improving their ability to make money. Give me a cut, you know? Well, I always find it interesting. And, and Peter, coming back to you, how many times, maybe in your past MSP, I know in my past MSP, when I went and I asked for more money and they're like, okay. Like whenever you get that response, I'm like, huh. I haven't been charging the right amount. <laughs> you know, like a light bulb went off and you're like, well, they, they didn't even balk, right? They're just like, sure, fine, no yeah. problem. And, you know. Yeah, we always we always uh, made it more scary to ourselves prior to pulling the trigger on a price increase than what we ended up seeing in the marketplace. And um, one of the things we used to do early on was a discount for longer term contracts. So um, we would do 5% if they would do a two year and 10% if they would do a three year. And we still see a lot of MSPs that are doing that. What you have to keep in mind, though, with that is you think you're cutting your price 10% and you are. But what you're really doing is giving away a much larger percentage of your uh, margin. So if I'm running best in class margins at 50% uh, service gross margin, look at the percentage of my margin I'm giving away by doing a 10% discount. And if I'm bottom quartile and I'm running 35% gross margin, I'm giving away a 10% discount. I'm giving away a th almost a third of my margin. So 
Um, so yeah, one of the first things we did was we got rid of that. So when I took over the MSP that I was running, um, I didn't come from the industry. I'm kind of an outlier in this industry. Um, I came from law and from executive leadership and sales leadership. Um, I'd been CEO of a fintech company for seven years and was hired to do a turnaround on a, at that point, a $2 million MSP that the prior 12 months lost a million five. So the wow. owner, uh, was uh, tired of writing checks and was at an age where he wanted to sell the business in the next few years. And so I thought, how hard can this business be? It's, uh, you know, it's the IT business. I, I know I, I've paid for IT over the years, right? I mean, this can't be that tough. Well, it's really tough. And so we had to uh, quickly learn some of those lessons. And so we stopped doing discounting. We changed our pricing. And every time we made a significant move on that, we always thought we're going to lose a huge percentage of our customers, right? One of the companies that um, that's a member of our peer group organization was talking to recently, and they did a price increase, a 10% price increase over the past year. And they did it uh, in addition to what was covered in their contracts. And they told their customers that if they, if uh, that it was a one-time thing, that it was due to inflation, price of labor, we want to continue to doing, uh, doing things at the same quality we've been doing them for you, et cetera, same quality of people. And um, and if you want out of your contract, we'll give you out of your contract. But this is a one-time thing we need to do. And I thought, wow, that's really, uh, uh, that's a bold move. And um, I think they lost about 3% of their customers. I mean, most of the customers had to uh, look at it and say, yeah, makes sense. We're all paying a lot more for raw materials and for people and for all those things too. So, um, so yeah, a lot of, it's easy to talk yourself out of doing a price increase for your customers out of fear, but at the end of the day, you've got to increase your pricing and, and labor costs are going up, uh, tool costs are going up, everything else around you is going up. Your customers are not going to bat an eye if you position it right. And if you're delivering the services that you said you would deliver and you're, and you're adding value to them, if you're, if you're helping them achieve their business goals, whether they're a 50 employee bank or whether they're Boeing, um, as the example earlier was cited, if you're helping them achieve their goals, they're going to value the services you're providing and pay you accordingly. Um, so make sure you're pricing them accordingly in a way that you can make the profitability you need to be making as a business. Hey, Is Peter, there, can I ask a question? You, you yeah. said that you had like a, a, a net loss of maybe 3% with, with, the res, with the gains, with the price increases minus the 3% loss. What was the net result to the business? Tremendously positive because that 10% increase is going straight to bottom line. That's a 100% improvement on margin. Uh, you're not, when you do a price increase, you're not increasing any of your overhead costs, you're not increasing anything else. You're just strictly adding to your your uh, service gross margin, and it's a passing along, passing through to your bottom line. So the the net increase to that business was tremendous. And while inflation's uh, the topic, don't just get this year. Negotiate your minimum step ups for the next five years of your contract. They'll yeah. Flip. Yeah, Keith, that's great. Great advice. Um, one of them, we see a bunch of mistakes on multi-year uh, multi-year contracts. Um, one of them that we see is we that we recommend against is we see a lot of providers doing a CPI peg increase, and that sounds really good. Um, I, I was kind of intrigued by that. Um, I saw a bunch of providers who had CPI plus a half or CPI plus one, and it, it's a great concept. The problem what I, that we've seen this year what is that when CPI is two or two and a half, three percent, people are passing that increase along. When it's eight and a half percent, I haven't found too many providers who are actually willing to pass along an eight and a half plus one increase. Um, all of a sudden, the customers who were readily agreed to it are uh, not so excited about it. Uh, so that that's one thing to keep in mind. The other thing is um, we would we would recommend staying away for, uh, from up to increases. We see a lot of uh, agreements, a lot of SLAs that have an up to 4% or up to five or up to six. The problem with that, like you said, Keith, get it out of the way at the beginning when you sign the contract so the customer knows every year, I'm gonna be paying 
X plus 5% or whatever the number, whatever your number is. Otherwise, if they see an up to what they're really thinking is we're going to be negotiating this every year, you're going to come back and you're going to say, yeah, I want to do uh, it's up to 5%. You want to do five. I want to do two. Let's figure it right. And you're trying to get away from that. You want to just have an expectation built into the long-term agreement. So that's great advice, Keith. Thank you. Um, is there any truth to the, hey, you know, the multi-year thing, you know, the two, three, four, I guess, five-year contract, you know, like, it, you know, is that still, you know, is that more of a financial requirement, you know, if you're trying to evaluate your business a certain way or borrow against future revenue rather than just the day-to-day -day operation of the business? Or, you know, a lot of people still run under, uh, hey, it, you know, we're, we're, we're going under eternity every year. Here's the price increase. If you want out, here's how much time we need notice to get out. And then, you know, kind of, you know, you can leave if you're not happy kind of process. Like, uh, you know, I appreciate, you know, the, the bigger the company the more you're trying to lock in and kind of, you know, making sure you can get your revenues, future revenues locked down. But like the smaller companies tend to not do the multi-year contract just because it seems like it's a little bit more of a, a rub to get somebody over the edge. Do you still, you know, what's your feeling on that topic? Yeah, there's some exceptions. First of all, it's, it's a religious discussion when it comes up in, in the rooms with uh, members um, that there's real strong feelings on both sides. My take on it and looking at the M&A landscape and looking at the industry overall is I think there's a couple of significant advantages to doing a longer term contract. Um, I don't see a lot of five year. I've seen a few of them. Most of what we see are two or three year contracts. And so if you do a, th if you do a multi year contract, there's a few advantages that I see. Number one is you're going to be more enticing to prospects who are looking to get married instead of date. So if somebody if somebody wants a month to month contract, um, everybody on this call knows the amount of your cost that it, that you're going to incur in the first six months of any engagement with onboarding, with smoothing out the environment and everything else that goes into it. So you really need time. I mean, we've done uh, recently we did some analytics on um, cost of sales acquisition and and the average cost to acquire an MSP customer, if you look all in, the average cost uh, is about twenty-five to thirty-two thousand dollars per new logo that you bring on. It's tough to bring on a new logo in our industry. You have sales costs, you have marketing costs, you have uh, all these other costs that add in. And and if you look at these average service gross margin over a three-year contract, that what we see is somewhere between uh, 44 and 90% of that margin is being eaten up with sales and marketing costs over three over a three-year contract. So if you only have that customer for a year, you're gonna have a you're, you're gonna have a really hard time making sufficient return. So the providers who I talk to who are doing month to month or doing annual contracts, they're banking on the quality of service and those customers are going to be with them for multiple years anyway. Well, if that's the case, why not do a, a two or three year contract? If you go up, if you go to sell your business, um, there are some providers I know who like to see one year or less contracts in place because that allows them to move, uh, right away move the customers to their their pricing and products. Most of the uh, buyers that I talk to they see the advantage of having a multi year contract and they're willing to pay more for it because it buys them a period of time to get stability and do integration. And the customer is not going into it thinking, I only I'm, I can get out of this contract at any point, or I only have three, three months left or four months left. The customer, at least initially, is thinking, I've got two years left on a three-year deal, or I've got a year and a half left. So they're going to probably be willing to provide a little bit more benefit of the doubt to the buyer and to the seller uh, going through integration. Um, now, ultimately, you've got to deliver. People are going to be able to get out of their contract for non-performance and other reasons if you're not doing the job. But um, but there's a there's a bunch of marketplace reasons and valuation reasons why it makes sense. And the other one is um, once you grow your business enough when, you know, and you have enough uh, clients, if you're having to go out every year and have a renewal discussion with all of your clients, it's a tremendous amount of resources that you're using that 
if you can do it every every three years instead and then focus during that three years on service delivery you save a lot of resource uh, requirements on it so um so i think there's a lot of advantages i've heard all the the reasons why you should do um month to month and get them in and annual agreements and have uh less of a barrier to the sale and um but i think the the uh more mature uh higher oml shops that we work with tend to do th at least two years if not three years interesting okay uh so by the way matt thanks matthew fox thanks for jumping in there yeah listen anytime you can understand profitability of your business and i think largely that's some of the challenge in IT MSP land that like everyone thinks, Hey, well, we're just going to make money no matter what. Well, <laughs> you know, I guess when it's just you, that's easy to think about, but once you start adding other people in the company, like profitability has to be part of the decision-making process on whether it makes sense to adopt, you know, a new client. Cause we all have had the, I mean, I, I can phrase it a lot of different ways, but the customer that you would willing to put a pain in the ass tax increase on your <laughs> services for, I mean, those are the ones that when you go back and figure out your actual math, you're not making money on those accounts, right? So like, you know, back to the dating versus marry kind of analogy, just kind of hard to tell walking in the door if you're getting, uh, you know, craziness or if you're getting somebody who's like, nope, get it. You do what you need to do so I can do what I you know have to do. And unfortunately, <laughs> you find that out, you know, once you're in the thick of things, right? And that's when, you know, it's the worst, you know, time to make a decision. But all that being said, understanding the math, I think, is part of the problem. And so the better you understand the math, like I've run into a lot of MSB business owners over my time, especially this year. Well, when like they now know more about their profit and loss statements and their balance sheets now than I've had heard ever. Uh, because they realize, right, they are actually running a business and like, you know, they need to understand what's good and what's bad so that they're not just, you know, at the end of the year, they look up and they're like, what did I accomplish this year? And why is my bank account empty? Um, unfortunately, that happens, you know, I guess to Peter's point, the top, you know, I don't know what the next 25% is, Peter, at the bottom 25%, they're losing almost 4%, you know, so that makes no sense, right? You're basically working, not even working for free, you're paying people to work. I don't think that makes sense. Well, I don't, like, actually, the cutoff to get into bottom quartiles, you're losing 3.8. The average is negative 10%. Wow. So, you know, if you're growing, if you're one of those businesses and you're growing your revenue, the good news is you're growing your revenue. The bad news is for every dollar you're adding, you're losing another 10 cents. So, um, yeah, you've got to really understand. And the, as the industry's matured and our data is readily available, we're out there talking about it and Anybody can benchmark with this. You don't have to be in a peer group. In fact, one of the nice things with ConnectWise buying us is that they've come out with a bunch of packages that have made our stuff really, really affordable, uh, way way more affordable than, and we thought it was pretty affordable before the acquisition. So anybody who wants to benchmark and learn about how they're doing compared to best in class can get a hold of a ConnectWise rep and sign up. It's it's uh, uh, in December, I think $4.99 a month for uh, for our full package of all of our products. Um, so, uh, so we have a lot of companies out there that are in peer groups that have learned these lessons. We have companies that aren't, but the data is out there, right? I mean, it, it, when those of us, uh, a lot of, a, a lot of, uh, the folks on this call, I assume have been in the industry a long time. And I remember when I joined in 2010, it was hard to get some of this information. I mean, the service gross margin numbers, you're figuring out how to price and package your stuff on your own. The This stuff was really, I mean, those of us who were in the industry earlier on, and there were a lot of you that were in the industry before that, it was really, you're, you're paving a trail and figuring it out. Today, that's not the case, right? If you're if you're a company that's out there losing money, the help is available. The knowledge is available. And, and my advice is the best in class, they're not working harder, right? They're not, they're not necessarily smarter. They, the bottom quartile companies I talked to, they're working plenty hard. They're, they're smart folks on the technical side. It's just, they need to tweak some things in their, in their business. And um, so, yeah, don't, don't put all this time and effort in. It's a stressful business. We all know that. It's a, it's a challenging business. Every day is, uh, it's exciting, but it's also challenging. Don't put all that work and effort in and come out of it with, with less than what you should on a yearly basis. And if you go to sell, you want to be able to really capitalize on all the years that you put all of your sweat equity into the business. 
I got a question for you. What was the, of the medium, what was the average net profit on those companies? And then that top quartile, what's their average profitability? Top quartile last quarter was about 23 and a half percent average. The cutoff to get in was seven in the 17s. Um, I could tell you exactly, um, but about 17, seven, I think. Uh, but the average was was right around 24, 25%. And that's that's been the case for the last several quarters. Um, uh, the average for the median was about uh, 8%. Um, so, you know, uh, and what we see, if you, if you blend all of that together, the average for the total industry last quarter was around 10%. So the outliers on the top are making up for uh, those who are those who are, who are losing money. Um, so, you know, right around 10. But um, but even in improving your business, the average MSP that we benchmark is about four and a half million of revenue per year. Uh, the average VAR that we benchmark, we benchmark 10 different business models. So different types of infrastructure service providers, different types of app dev providers. And then we benchmark uh, product centric, which is a VAR, which means in our definition, more than 60% of your revenue comes from product, including hardware, software, and recurring revenue, not managed service revenue, but cloud and 365, et cetera. Um, the average bar that we benchmark is about 50 million. So, you know, if you're doing uh 20% profitability as a $4 million business, four and a half, um, and you're doing uh, the best in class is a little lower for VARs. If you're doing 15%, but you got a $50 million business, you're still doing just fine, right? Um, but if you if you are any of the businesses that you run, figure out next year if you're even if you're profitable or you uh, and you're in the median, how can I get ten percent more profitability? If I'm making, if I'm a four and a half million dollar uh, shop and I'm making eight hundred thousand a year, how can I take that to eight eighty? How can I how can I just boost it ten percent? Um, and so if you're an average MSP. At four and a half million, at average profitability, and and you boost it ten percent, you're going to make about another fifty thousand next year. But based on the M and A multiples that are out there, if you go to sell your business, that additional ten percent is going to be worth about another four hundred thousand dollars on the sale. So um, so incremental change is is how you get there. Um, focus on. There's no silver bullet on, on our, our magic way to run the business that make this one change and all of a sudden life will be great. Um, it's a lot of littles and just, but focus in on those every year and it makes a huge difference over time. I, I think one of the things important on the multi-year is not only do you have the increases built in, you have the ability to sell more into that business, which will increase your profitability. And as you mature with them, your service delivery becomes more efficient year after year. We see substantial declines in the hours we spend servicing customers while their payment goes up. And so I think that's something that you people don't consider when they design their long-term contracts is because as you, you develop their processes and procedures, you develop their workflows and you make them more efficient in, internally, their support costs go down while your income goes up. Yeah, that third that third year and beyond, you sh they should be much more profitable as a client. And uh, the two things that are always um, that you hear from a lot of clients that are funny. One is when it came to you, we were calling in all the time during the first year, but the last two years we hardly need to call in or send any tickets. And so we we think we should get a, a reduction in our price. And like, well, you understand the reason why you're not having to call in as much and send as many tickets in. Um, you really want to get rid of that. Um, that and the other one that George you mentioned earlier is the bigger we are, the more, the less per seat we should have to pay. Um, and you see additional complexity uh, of supporting larger T TCPs uh, are much more complex to support and require a lot more help. So, man, this is the stuff that really like this is the, this gets to the bottom of the entire story, right? I think Peter, this was great. I think we could probably go another hours probably and in digging into some of these topics like you said uh lisa you had raised your hand by the way thanks for connecting this together lisa i really appreciate that um great great topic today great content <laughs>
I, I was just going to say, um, he mentioned the sleek. Um, one of the things that ConnectWise has done as well is put a business management package together, which actually includes sleek. So there's a couple different ways to go about it. Um, there's a couple of folks on the phone, I think we're talking that were been on the call that we um, uh, review on that with them now. So it, it is pretty cool. Uh, we're trying to put together really a business solution versus just, hey, here's a PSA. You know, this is going to help you with operational maturity. This is going to help you with your customer feedback. So just all those things together, I think, can help with uh, efficiencies and, you know, um, our partners. Anyway, so if somebody thank you. wanted to, no, thank you. <laughs> somebody wanted to go and say, hey, I want to get access to some of this service leadership stuff. Maybe they want to participate, right, in the future and like submit data. Where do they find more information? Is there like a landing page for service leadership on ConnectWise? Sure, they can go two places. Uh, they can go, service leadership is still run within ConnectWise as a standalone entity. And the reason for that is our licensing agreements with our clients on their benchmarking data require uh, that data to be held, a wall around that data and it to be held in uh, um, really close confidence. So, um, so service leadership is wholly owned by ConnectWise as of uh, almost exactly two years ago but we still operate as a standalone business unit. And so our website is service-leadership.com. Uh, you can go there and, and get information and, and uh, reach out to contact us on the website. And you can also go to your ConnectWise rep. Um, the ConnectWise reps uh, we've been, have done a great job of learning about our products and uh, really understanding how they can help uh, TSPs out there. And uh, ConnectWise, as Lisa mentioned, we've got a couple of really compelling pricing and packaging ways that uh, you can get both benchmarking and sleek. Um, so they've made it the, the philosophy that ConnectWise has with us, by the way, is they know that our customers grow faster, are more profitable, and tend to be the ones doing acquisitions and, um, and uh, succeeding more in the industry. And so they really cut the prices with the goal. The goal that has been stated to us is they want to see us uh, do a five X increase over the next few years. And we already work with a huge sample of, of TSPs worldwide. So, um, so they've priced it so that if you want to get, if you want to benchmark and learn about it, it's, um, it's really affordable to do it. Well, I think hey, I, I got another, I got one last question for you. Go ahead. Go ahead Why would somebody pick service leadership over true methods and Pico? Where's your competitive advantage? Um, First of all, I have a huge amount of respect for Gary. I, I like Gary and, and what he does. Um, I, our data set and what we benchmark, I think, is unique in the industry. I'm not going to talk specifically about differences between our stuff and and Gary's, but our data set is is a one of a kind data set in the industry. We've been benchmarking financial uh, data the longest. We have the largest benchmark sample every quarter. Um, the way that we do it has been really tried and tested um so i just the the data that we've got nobody else has so and um and others are out there that are doing more uh we do some operational benchmarking we do some service metrics um there's there's other shops out there that are doing that maybe on a pretty big scale as well but from a financial benchmarking standpoint um nobody has what we have so they've been doing it the longest and the widest. That's what I got. That may be the answer. Uh, awesome. This was great. Um, Peter, hope, hopefully we can get you back. Otherwise, everyone, thanks for jumping on. I know it's Christmas week. Uh, I don't think we have any more sessions until the 29th, which is right before New Year's. So take a little bit of time to close out the year. I, like I said, it's been super busy. I'm sure that's been the same for everyone. Just how the end of the year is working out here. Uh, hopefully that that's good good going into next year last thought peter on the way out the door um 2023 if you had any word in your head are you thinking it's going to be a down year for service providers or up year for service providers i think it's going to be another good year um that you know there's certainly a lot of talk about recessions we're looking closely at the data to see if the macroeconomic uh headwinds that are out there are affecting the industry we're not seeing any signs of it today we're the the uh data we look at a number of different data points and q3 those data points were even better than q2 so we think the year is going to finish well we think the year is going to start well next year and and um and recessions bring a different type of challenge and opportunity to msps that's a different subject for a different day but 
all in all, we think it'll it'll be another good year, George. I love it. Thank you very much, everyone. This session. One more be- important question for George. Okay, go ahead, Keith. A bottle on the twenty fourth again. Uh, <laughs> let, me, let me let me let now that we know some some new news. Let's let's let me peep, you know chew on that. I'll get back to you. But otherwise, this session was recorded. You can find it uh, online shortly at mspinitiative.com under sessions. By the way, if you have questions for Peter, I'm sure you just go on LinkedIn or Google him. You'll find him, service-leadership.com. By the way, again, special shout out to Lisa Kelly, who's been jumping on these sessions now for several months and connecting this together. This was great today. I hope to have you on soon again. Thank you very much. Merry Christmas. Merry Christmas. See ya.